Thank you, Image Africa, for this opportunity. And uh, the title of this presentation is uh, it's quite broad, Transforming Medical Education. Uh, all of us embrace AI and the recent hype about AI, you know, recently, lately, in educational spaces. Most of us are aware of it. So this is a kind of snapshot of uh, what, how I embrace AI in my teaching space. I will provide with the context in a moment. So let me move to the next slide. So as you'd have read from the description, this is presentation will focus on how um, AI can impact, can have a transformative impact within medical education. I will show from practical experience how students can benefit, especially having a very diverse uh, student body in our space. Uh, how do we really foster that collaborative problem solving, especially in medicine, in disciplines like immunology, which is quite complex. So this is one way of really kind of doing personalized learning or tailor-made for students who are really struggling with very complex concepts at a second year level of MBCHP, which is perceived to be the most difficult year. And I will also illustrate how AI can promote technological literacy and other essential kind of non-negotiable skills like critical thinking, um, lack like of engagement with the content and with their peers, etc. So moving on, let us start with a fun Mentimeter activity. So if you have your device next to you, you can use your cell phone. Please go and type menti.com and you're going to type in this code, 2618-6445. So I'm asking you, what comes into your mind when you hear the word AI? Everybody's talking about AI being Tony, artificial sure intelligence. <laughs> so literally what comes into your mind? I have to provoke. When you hear the words. Yes. I'm glad I like the provoking. So can you see chat GPT? Okay, that's a good stop. Others, let's hear from you. That's two responses now. Hallucination. Oh, that's interesting. Another couple of responses, then we can move on. Hallucination, chat GPT, evolution, innovation. Wow. Robotics. Okay, you can keep that coming. Uh, let me move back to our presentation. Thank you very much for responding to that mentee. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Going into full screen now, bear with me. So, to introduce AI in education, um, there are three things I would like to highlight in this presentation. So, the learner oriented AI and with the AI technology, like how students can use AI to receive and understand new information. Because sometimes complex disciplines like medicine, um, students can get overwhelmed with the bombardment of a lot of complex information. So how this interaction can really kind of assist. And the next one is how can really educators can reduce their workloads, can be automating certain processes, or even to kind of design some of the formative tasks in their classrooms. And they can also gain some insights about students, giving them a task, which I'll show you in my context how I would have done they can really innovate in their classroom. So instruct-orientated and, um, you know, how the instruct-orientated AI and technology can really kind of assist. And the last but not least, from an individual to an educator, how institutions can embrace. For example, that is the kind of current, you know, kind of contestation around, you know, the ethics of AI. How can it really allow institutions, you know, what constitutes plagiarism, what is a reasonable use of AI, et cetera. So it makes um, institutions to make informed decisions, and especially if they really wanting, you know, to embed AI in the teaching, learning, and assessment practices. So this is a reference from 2019. Moving on, AI in medical education, why? If you think about it, it's to enhance the learning. I already introduced the complexity of the discipline. 
how can um, knowledge gaps can be addressed and also improving patient care. And now with, you know, somebody mentioned uh, robotics. With all this automated stuff, this manual kind of things, which is very intense, which is very labor and um, resource intensive, can really, uh, we can deploy AI. And how can it advance the healthcare and empowering the next generation of healthcare professionals is by enhancing the patient care. Uh, as I told you, if you have AI embed, uh, embed into the practices of certain things, where again, I'm using the word very cautiously because the humanistic interactions elements are equally important. It's not like one over the other. This is more about what are the current things, existing things, how can we really enhance what is currently kind of out there? And obviously it's in a, in a bigger kind of picture, it contributes to advancing medicine. And one need to be uh, ethically considerate when we use as much as we claim to be, it's very personalized and efficient. And also how do you really foster trust between students, faculty and AI? This is something which all of us are grappling with. It's very early days, even though it got introduced, the last version uh, was last year. And when people started using it, still we need to have clear guidelines, policies, what constitutes kind of, you know, good practice um, when, when it comes into AI. So why AI in medical education? There needs an update of the medical curriculum. I mean, we call so-called digital natives. Students really have exposure to technology since they are very young. So it's about transforming the healthcare driven by AI. And the three things, especially in uh, health sciences um, context, the critical thinking, problem solving, and self-directed learning. It can be a phenomenal kind of, it can use, it can play a vital role when it comes into enhancing the student learning. And how do you really kind of equip healthcare professionals with the knowledge and skills to ethically and responsibly use AI applications? And um, it's more about, you know, as I told, they're dealing with people's lives, they're dealing with human beings on a daily basis, but how can you really equip for them to use it with caution and also to kind of enhance their workspace. So I'll take a moment. Um, if there anybody would like to share anything, I don't want this to be very monotonous, just you know, kind of transmitting um, information. Uh, before we move on to immunology, which is my kind of uh, discipline, uh, if there is anybody would like to make a comment, would like to type in, in the chat, feel free. This is the opportunity. And we do have some experts also here. So feel free in terms of if you would like to articulate um, what's really kind of coming into your mind, hearing all these things. Any takers? I hope everybody is still awake. <laughs> Yes, Jay, we are here. We are very awake. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No pressure. Thank you for your wonderful pre presentation. So no pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So now I'm switching gears, right? I'm introducing AI. How can AI can be used in disciplines like immunology, teaching, and learning? Um, before I do that, there is clear evidence. I mean, you can see the oldest reference. It started in 1997. And it's a very complex field. Immunology, for uh, those of you who haven't heard the word, I'm sure most of you have heard, it's the study of immune system. Your whole pathology, disease mechanisms, patterns, everything revolves around study of immune system. It's a very complex field. And students, um, even qualified you know, clinicians, sometimes get intimidated and due to the complexity of the field. It's a very rapidly evolving field lot of advancements, lot of research, and lot of unresolved kind of things happening. And how can these complex concepts can be understood and how it can relate um, clinically? So these are like some evidence. And how can students, um, uh, you know, develop that confidence and ability to visualize? Because it's like kind of myth. Sometimes if you do not see it in your naked eye, sometimes it's very difficult to kind of grasp you know, how do these mechanisms, what's an innate immunity? How does the antibodies work? All those kind of things are in theory, but the broader visualization students normally kind of grapple with. 
So in this is the complexity of immunology and there is a lot of literature which has been published, especially from medical students' point of view. So moving on, I would like to introduce how I have embraced. So this is a tutorial to introduce my context. I'm the co-course convener for two MBCHP courses. The medical degree we call it MBCHP here at UCT. It's a six year degree. And the first three years are preclinical years and students get taught immunology. So this is a second half of second year MBCHP students. That's the context. And it forms part of the integrated health systems courses. So it's very systems based approach. Students um, use cases which are revolving around the problem based learning. At UCT, we use supported problem based learning. We call it SPBL because we need to be mindful. As much as the pedagogy of problem based learning is quite powerful, dates back to, I think, late 70s in McMaster Universities in Canada. But that's the global north. In the global south setting, how do you really adapt? We need to provide enough support for our diverse student body coming from all parts of South Africa. That's why we have the SPBL curriculum and students work with cases and the SPBL entails an eight-step process and students do this uh, eight-step process um, for every case there are four sessions. So uh, that having said that, students are given lectures, students are given tutorials and practicals. Since immunology is quite complex and you know, for the past kind of anecdotal evidence reveals, students sometimes hand in blank pages because they get very intimidated and they do not have enough time to engage in depth. Sometimes it gets overlooked. And in an integrated course, it might not make significant difference in their performance, but it's very concerning students qualifying as medical doctors without having the foundation of immunology. That's why this got introduced, actually, um, this initiative. I ran it with my colleague, and since 2019, the immunology tutorials has been formally introduced into the curriculum in second and third year. So this is the case they have they've been dealt with. There are like cases um, which we use PBL as the mode of uh, delivery. Um, they, along with lectures, tutorials, and practicals, they meet with a small group environment to go through the case and learning objectives. That's how they learn. So to enhance their learning, these immunology tutorials, this specific one which happened a week ago, um, they were doing the HIV case. Obviously, you know, these cases are built around what is the dire need within a South African health system. As a generalist practitioner, after six years when they qualify, what are some of the things students need to have, the knowledge, skills, attitudes, uh, when it comes into dealing with these kind of prominent, prevalent conditions or diseases around. So this has evolved. Last year, I did do a chat GPT activity because the whole AI was really, really was introduced. People were quite, quite curious. And it's high time, I as a co-convener, as an educator, I realized if we do not explicitly introduce chat GPT in our curriculum or use of AI to just expose students so that they can make decide for themselves how they can effectively use it or how much they can rely on it. So uh, this is how I have done. It's a two hour tutorial. I had like two to three tutors helping on each day. The whole class of 273 students were really split into four groups, Monday to Thursday, two hours each. So I developed the timeline um, because, again, medical students, the time is precious. Within two hours, what is the maximum we can get out of these tutorials? So the first task, um, as you can read from here, I posed three set of questions. Because they were doing HIV case, how can I really scaffold? Because it's a spiral curriculum we have at UCT. So I introduced three questions with an action word. How, what is the overall immune response to microorganisms with a special focus on bacteria and viruses? Because they've been doing immunology since year one, semester two, they might have forgotten or they need a refresher so that when they deal applying those threshold or basic fundamental immunological concepts, they have the ability to apply. That's why I started with the basics of asking them to revise this, then asking them to go into more depth about immune responses to viruses. And the last one is how does immunity to HIV occur in their setting? 
And um, once after an hour and 15 minutes, students were asked in the same subgroups, or oh, I forgot to mention, students were split into groups of um, four per subgroup, and each one of them were tasks. So it happened in the computer lab, they were sitting in groups of four. And the next activity, this is what where the AI come into play. In the same subgroups, I asked them to type in the same questions in the chat GPT, because some of the students, when I asked them, they've already been using chat GPT for their learning. Then I asked them to generate the responses. Then I asked them to engage with the chat GPT responses and compare them with the activity one responses. Then the last third one, I think that's for me is the highlight where the students critical thinking and you know kind of evaluating the authenticity and accuracy of concepts came into play which I show you in a moment, how do they identify any similarities, inaccuracies and discrepancies between the two? And I asked them to jot them down. So all, all these subgroups had a Word document open. Out of the four members, one was a scrap. And in the final 20 minutes, I asked feedback from each group. So we had a plenary discussion where students were helping each other to kind of validate the knowledge and asking questions. So I kind of led that kind of discussion at the end. I will take a moment because it's too much. I kind of feels like I just rushed it through. Uh, is everybody clear with what exactly how I introduced chat GPT in the tutorial in activity two? Feel free to type it in the chat if you have a question or any clarification before I go on to um, highlighting from educational staff. Jay, when you say describe immunity to HIV, do you mean when people are actually immune to HIV, how does that work? That's a good question, Tony, because I deliberately used immunity to HIV, right? You do not get immune. There's a small population with a mutation um, which are kind of, you know, they kind of resistant, I mean, in layman's term. But this is more to elicit how does your immune response um, kind of act towards getting once a person is infected with HIV. That's what it was referring to, this immunity to HIV. So that means we do not have, most of us do not have our immune system tackling HIV because HIV is very tricky. It goes and hides in sanctuary sites and it really escapes your immune defense mechanisms built. Uh, compared to other viruses. So that's a very good question, Tony. So that was deliberate. So that's it kind of distracts students, especially number three. The reason why I'm saying that is when they went and typed in number three, it just gave what exactly what you were highlighting. It talked about, you know, how people were prevented, that small group, it focused only on that. It didn't really go into depth about immune responses. How does your body act to? I know it's kind of ambiguous, the word, the, the wording, but it, it was deliberation, <laughs> if I'm making sense. So moving on this, this is, I found it fascinating. Uh, this group came up with a table. They identify what are the similarities and discrepancies. For example, for the three questions, they said the similarities are both included the significance of CCR5, but now the differences they're saying, the chat GPT actually went more on into depth on these HLA variant, these concepts. And um, we discussed mechanism of evasion of HIV from immune system. So that means the bullet point number one and three is more came from what they have really drafted, their response, the original preparation. Whereas the number two focused on one particular one, the elite controller, so it's only one aspect of the whole immune responses to HIV. If you go into number one, the immunity to bacteria and viruses, they're saying certain things weren't included. Some included more and it included, it kind of completely neglected certain key concepts. So I don't want to get into very technical stuff, but I will show you what all those things translate into. And for example, this subgroup, there are three, uh, two subgroups here. They really compared and they say, our response was kind of, you know, chat uh, GPT responses are broader and they just scratch on the surface of the immune responses. That means the students are able to evaluate 
the authenticity and the accuracy and the relevance of the responses churned out by ChatGPT. Whereas this group, they say it effectively captures the essential points without going into intricate detail. Whereas they original detailed response offers a comprehensive explanation. And the last one they're highlighting is the detailed response is more informative. So the detailed response in this case is the one which they worked before the chat GPT, which is activity one. So they they for me, this is phenomenal because this is the whole kind of learning outcome or objective which I wanted to accomplish through this tutorial. And before this, when I introduced the tutorial, I asked them about evaluating the uh, authentic sources for them to go and consult. I also made a deliberation and I said, please do not use chat GPT because the whole activity two is going to be about chat GPT. So for activity one, they utilized reliable websites like World Health Organization or um, textbooks, all those kind of reliable resources. So what does this mean for me as an educator? So AI for moving students from remembering to the higher order thinking skills. That is what all of us strive to. Because at some stage, we want students to analyze, evaluate, and create. Create, like, I mean, that's really the highest of the high. But how can we really move students from just recalling facts and able to apply, understand and apply analyze and evaluate. Yeah. So through this collaborative learning setting, to a certain extent kind of, even though they did done it in small groups, some of them kind of, they self-directed learning in my view. They given instructions, but um, the tutors were floating around to guide, they facilitate their thinking, but it wasn't really kind of, you know, um, provided kind of spoon fed, if I, if I may use that word. So this is how I see how they evaluate and they made the judgment. That is why that last part of this one, they're asking about to identify similarities, inaccuracies, and discrepancies. That mm -hmm. it's really phenomenal because they're able to evaluate. Because they've done the work, now they're using chat GPT, now they're evaluating how accurate or whatever it is. And, and every uh, subgroup, they came with very, very, very useful stuff. So for me, this is a win situation for me because it's always used to sit here. Tutorial, you give a question, students discuss in groups, they regurgitate the facts, and then so what? So moving um, on to evaluating and creating, obviously creating is the first prize, but again, one need to be carefully thought through and given the time constraint for a two hour tutorial, are we really being realistic for students to create? So that means it needs to be a separate project and it's an integrated course. I can't take all the time for immunology alone. That's going to be very tricky. So, yeah, these are some of the resources, uh, references I've used. And this I've already shown in a presentation result is what are students saying? For example, this one, the response is about 16 students. They really see that this tutorial facilitate the understanding of the content. They saying yes. It really, it looks like nobody's scoring one and two. So all of them are saying it enhanced, but it's at varied levels, if you think, if you look at it. So understanding of the content. Mode of delivery also, except for this one candidate, all the other 15 of them are agreeing the mode of delivery of the tutorial was quite effective. They seem to have really enjoyed it. And that is was very clear in these feedback. We were able to see how we could embrace it in our learning in good way. It's an eye-opening, especially for students who, who hasn't used chat GPT. It's, it's a very good opportunity for them in a safe environment along with their peers to learn about it and see some of the benefits and some of the pitfalls. And then I enjoyed the inclusion of chat GPT. I'm glad our convenience of progressive. We also got to explore its limitations. So that is some of the student feedback. So to me, progressive teaching and learning demands that we embrace AI. We cannot operate as if, you know, we still live in the very old traditional kind of setting. And students are really, really kind of, you know, very experimental, very inquisitive. And how can we capture that curiosity and inquisitive and, um, you know, use it to our advantage? For me, that's a low hanging fruit. If all of us can really carefully thought through our spaces, our discipline, 
definitely, you know, AI can really do um, wonders. So yeah, I'm happy to take questions. There is another Mentimeter activity. So I'm very happy to take questions. And when you're ready, then we can do the last um, Mentimeter to just gain some feedback about what are your kind of insights based upon what you have heard. I just have showed a, just a snapshot of one tutorial, one discipline located within a course and one cohort of students, maybe two, last year and this year, two cohort of students. So yeah, Irene, I'm happy to take any questions. I'll take a pause here. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for, for your presentation. And I think we have a, a question from Kamala. Please go on. Thanks very much, Jay. That was so enlightening. Um, so I think you've guessed absolutely right. Um, so I, for one, have not used Jet, Chat GPT for anything yet, uh, but we are in an environment where our students are exposed to all of this technology and they will use it, especially if they're struggling. So my question is, how do we guard against them being overwhelmed by all of the knowledge when they do use these? And is there something we can put into place where we, we try to control it as much as possible or say maybe if they're going to use it for curriculum work, do it within uh, a supported setting? Um, do you have any thoughts or ideas on that? Because for me, I think students, as you know, get easily overwhelmed um, and and our knowledge is already quite extensive of what we provide them. Um, so I think I would just, yeah, just to, to just things to think about and how we could guard against it. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Really appreciate your kind words. So um, definitely one need to use it with caution. You are absolutely right in saying um, with anything, you no know, technological influence can overwhelm. I mean, we already have um, dire need of, you know, sound mental health practices in our spaces. So one, for me, it's about capturing that kind of, you know, the curiosity, the, the willingness to learn and creating that fun environment. For me, this is more like an experiment rather than then sitting and struggling and stuff. Now they're going to be using it with caution. So, I mean, we, we openly deliberately say, yes, you can go and check. But this is what revealed in one tutorial, right? Are you going to rely on that information or how much time would you be spending on that? So it's also holding each other accountable, right? You have lecture slides that should be a first port of call. But if you're really struggling, how can you go and use that kind of information and develop that foundational building blocks? Because to uh, from my observation, ChatGPT is very good especially for students who are really academically struggling, it gives an overview, like a story with subheadings. That is like, you know, people might perceive that as different, but that could be a useful stepping stone for them to really kind of, you know, um, gather complex concepts. But as educators, it's our responsibility. I do agree with you. It's not like, you know, you need to guide them. You're not like expecting them to just change overnight their behavior and embrace AI. That's not going to happen. You need to guide them through and also constantly make them reflect. What is it good for them and what they should refrain from? And also um, in an academic higher education institution, they need to be able to articulate their argument and writing and, um, and kind of, you know, presenting. So, it's about building those kind of skills, but they need to be aware of it. So yeah, I do not have a straightforward answer, but I do hear your kind of concern. No, thank you, Jay. Now that makes a lot of sense. And I think it just, uh, it's it's the basic principles that we have to go back to. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Tony? Jay, thanks. I've got a two and a half, maybe two and three quarter part question. Um, the first part really is, um, have you been using chat GPT or other tools in other activities? The second one is what kind of feedback do you have from your students about their use of generative AI in their studies? Okay, 
So, Tony, uh, definitely this hasn't been used in any other formal setting. That's my understanding. Even when I ask the students, it's just complete blank silence. Uh, I do not think they get introduced to that in their spaces. And answering to your number two, the way I interpret this is more about the tutorial feedback. Is that is what you are alluding to? And um, um, I I have published an evaluation for them that, you know, as students, sometimes the response rate, I need to send constant reminders. It's the response rate hasn't been great. They just seeing this more from very immunology tutorial perspective. Maybe I need to facilitate more about thinking um, broadly than reflecting and, you know, just kind of making that explicit links and everything. So definitely I do not have that as something um, maybe I can chat to you off A eh? and how do I really go about this? Because definitely there is a huge need in our space in preclinical years. Maybe we need to uh, develop some framework or along with you and other civil colleagues. So yeah, I, the, except for those feedback I've shown, I do not have that much feedback from students, even the last year in the current cohort. It's very limited responses. Thanks, Jay. I remember that in the SILT presentation, yep. your colleague was talking about how there was an attempt to use an application called consensus hmm. with immunology students to gain access to um, good quality research about debates in immunology, as far as I understand. Hmm. Is that correct? Uh, to be honest, it's not from us. It could be a student-led uh, staff. I think you're mentioning about the student who presented with me. Absolutely. It could be a student-led initiative. You are right, Tony. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not really kind of uh, clued up of exactly how they went about it. But uh, definitely, they are experimenting things because there is a student curriculum uh, like Kotla within the faculty, which also you would remember from the presentation. Thank They're you. They're really experimenting. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions or comments? Feel free. Um, that's how we learn. Any other insights? Hope I made sense with what I have shared. Um, Hi, Jay. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Did Go for it. And I think it's very, very interesting um, listening and seeing how AI is actually applied to your teaching activities. And I mean, we can clearly see that we are really in the AI generation and beyond. We actually using it as part of our teaching activities. Um, AI tools itself in healthcare is also another um big thing that um, one can research into. For example, if it's issues around immunology, are there AI tools that can detect some of these things, um, you know, without surgery and all of that? So um, if we demystify the idea of AI right from the beginning, from the classrooms and all of that, I think that in the long term, when they start practicing, um, it will be much easier for them to use AI-assisted tools in healthcare yeah. and transform um, uh, what we call it, healthcare service delivery within our, I mean, sub-Saharan African region or wherever they find themselves. So I think yeah. it's a very good way also to demystify that idea. That, yeah. yeah, so that is very interesting, yeah. Absolutely, Ravik, sir. Thank you very much. And again, that's the next step in terms of, you know, what are the specialized tools for certain disciplines? And especially um, across interdisciplinary, um, intersectoral kind of even collaboration. I mean, it's it's really kind of interpreted very differently based upon, again, the ethical principle should always be the kind of underlying principles of build out any of these kind of things. So I completely agree with you. I think we're still in early days. Uh, I do not have an answer, to be honest. Um, we need to explore in terms of anything specific for immunology, kind of immune things when it comes into clinical, 
maybe anybody in the audience might know something which is kind of used specifically for things. Tony, are you aware of anything? I'm not aware of any tools for immunology particularly, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking of the way that there has been um, massive money invested in development of tools for the development of new medicines. Mm -hmm. um, and wondering at what point that becomes part of the health sciences curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So again, um, you know, in terms of health professionals coming together and also clinicians and educators, I think the, the dialogue needs to it needs to be ignited at some stage. As much as we tend to, you know, uh, be scared or be intimidated or we don't know whether we're doing the right thing, but it's high time. We need to have the dialogues because as somebody highlighted, the younger generation are moving ahead. So we need to really kind of, you know, sooner the better. So in terms of in five years time, um, whatever is happening, I mean, in China, in some other settings, it's already happening. Uh, maybe they're doing it in a very fun way, not so much of a, a healthcare kind of setting. Robots operating and doing all this mundane stuff. Previously used to have human beings doing that. And um, so I think... Yeah, it's critical now. We are at a, a time point where this needs to be really prioritized. That's my two cents to me. So maybe, yeah, the, the, the faculty leaders and, you know, the policy makers and the educationists um, as a nation, I mean, if they introduce robotics and uh, if I'm not mistaken, high school, I think they introduced, they did a pilot, uh, the Department of Basic Education, and they got formally... I'll be enrolling robotics as a mandatory subject for this younger generation, um, high school or yeah, school learners. So it needs to be kind of gradually integrated from year one uh, upwards. That's my kind of insight into how that needs to be happening. Okay, so... Um, is there anything in the chat? Oh, wow. Okay, Tony, we can really definitely, you have so many questions, we can take this offline. And um, yeah, the second one, the Mentimeter, if you can please just type in a key take home message from this presentation while I'm just checking um, the you, responses. You might want to move the, the Menti slide for us so that we can answer. Yes, thank you. Okay, all right. Make things easier. Wow, okay. I'm going to share in a moment. Can everybody access that? The second one, key take home Yes, message. perfect, perfect, perfect. Thank yes. you so much. And those who are joining, we have the, the code in the chat. It's 2618644. It's in menti.com and you can join the, the conversation there. Thank you, Eileen. Let me share that screen. Then we can see live. What are some of the responses? There we go. Analyze and evaluate. make things easier if anybody would like to unmute and just kind of highlight what they would like to share that's also fine embrace ai here to stay insightful thank you We move back to my other screen, like to officially kind of Gen A needs to be taken on with all its uses and risks so students aren't left on their own. Absolutely. I really appreciate that one. 
Okay, and yeah, while that is happening, um, I don't know if you can see my slides. So my last slide is to, to just thank everybody for your time and the engagement and allowing my little attempt to try AI. This is my second year. Uh, I must also admit, um, my kind of engagement with the students has really enhanced since I experimented last year. And I'm sure this can only get better. Then I'll be as an educator, um, pedagogically, you know, conscious. I'll be really using it in ways that they can really kind of reap the benefits. You know, as long as the learning outcomes gets completion, students see this as a, a kind of, you know, helping tool so that they feel less overwhelmed and that collaborative peer kind of um, learning. I think for me, that's the highlight. You know, and I, I consciously tell the students, it's not like because I'm bored, I'm asking you to do these kind of activities. It's it's definitely, it underpins certain things um, from an educator, which I've observed over the years. So that is what I always try to share with them. And I must say, the students really embrace it and they're very excited and, you know, they really willing to kind of share. And yeah, on that note, uh, I would like to, yeah, thank Image, thank Irene, Yako, Tony, the whole uh, team. And um, yeah, maybe uh, once I try more tools, Tony, I'm going to come and knock on your door. I'm really, really willing to learn um, about more tools and how one can really effectively use within our space. I would really appreciate that. And um, any final questions before we say bye? And thanks, Ralitsa. Thank you, Sujay. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'll just wave goodbye. Irene, is there any final words from you and Yako? <laughs> oh, I'm really happy. Thank you so, so much for a wonderful session and for agreeing to do this for us and for the Image Africa community and other guests that we had today. Uh, we are very happy um, that the AI in higher education is continuing um, and we are seeing all the different ways that AI is being used in different um, uh, settings. So I've shared a link uh, for you to give us feedback. Uh, it's, it's a two minute um, form. So you can, the link is in the chat. Please give us feedback. And thank you for being here and thank you, Jay, for everything. Uh, Bye for now, everyone, and see you uh, soon for another session. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you all.